Well, welcome everybody back to this week's episode of Therapy for Dads podcast. Um, I have a friend of mine, a guest returning, who's been on the show before, Darren, Darren Davidson, who I'm glad we're having this conversation. It's something we've been talking about doing for a while. And this episode is going to be, I think, very informative as it is informational and educational. And also we get to geek out a little bit about something that we have both been getting training in individually, kind of parallelly, parallelly, it's not even a word, paralleling each other. I don't know. That works. That. <laughs> and we, we both been wanting to kind of bring this into this space to have a conversation about what we've been learning and, but more specifically, kind of how we can make it apl- applicable to our day in, day out lives with ourselves, with our families, with our friends, with what we do is in our workplace, all those things and, and the importance of it. So welcome back, Darren. How are you doing tonight? Great, Travis. Thanks for having me back and I'm looking forward to it. We're going to have a yeah. good good conversation, I think. Yeah. And real quick, elevator spiel of who you are real quick for those that haven't maybe haven't heard your first episode. Real quick, who is Darren? What do you do? So I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training, but what I really focus on currently is promoting mind-based and body-based skills from a polyvagal informed lens, which we're going to get into over our conversation to pursue and promote health, well-being and sustainable high performance. My main area of interest is doing that with healthcare professionals, but of course it applies really to everybody. And so I'm happy to do that work with, with anybody that's interested in, in pursuing their health, well-being and being at their best and Hopefully that's that's a large number of people. Yeah, and great elevator speech, by the way. I could tell you've worked at it. <laughs> yes, how to think about it and you know give that speech <laughs> once or twice before. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And, and that's totally what tonight's about is about this this thing. Some some of you may be tuning in this week and already know what this is. Some of you may like maybe have done training in this. Some of you may have heard it floating around the interwebs or seen it. Some of you may know it without no without like knowing it about kind of what it is, but not knowing her, the term polyvagal theory before, but you kind of know the bits and pieces of it. And so, and for some of you, this might be completely, utterly brand new information, mind blowing, right? And no matter where you are, I think it, it's going to be super, super helpful. So let's jump into kind of, you know, and, and as a quick side note, this is a, and we're going to be doing an overview and talking about applications of polyvagal theory. I'm going to be linking some resources. If you would, if you want to go in a more deep dive yourself and really get into it, I'm going to have some links in this episode of to the Polyvagal Institute, along with other resources around this kind of topic. But for, for to, this episode's purpose, it's we're going to kind of, we're going to talk about it kind of from our perspective, using mm-hmm. our language about the model. So with that said, just to kind of put that in that side that in no way in, in shape or form is this going to be exact specifics of everything, you know, this is just a conversation around it. So yeah. I just want to be clear on that, that, you know, we're not reading from a textbook or things like that. We're just kind of hopefully making it applicable to normal people who aren't doing research and things like that. So with that said, that's the goal. <laughs> what, and that's the goal, right? We, yeah. yeah. I think that's the goal for both of our professions is that we want to take this theory, this concept and actually make it usable and applicable to everyday ordinary people, which is us included. Yeah. I'm part of that everyday ordinary people, by the way, but make it useful and make it something that could be life changing and life giving and all those things that Darren said about helping healthcare professionals, making them continue to perform at their peak. And so with that said, what is, according to you and kind of what you know about it, what is kind of polyvagal theory in essence? Well, so just to lay the, the foundation, it was first described by Dr. Stephen Porges in the early to mid 1990s. So it's it's been around for quite some time, but it really seems like to take get your take on it, Travis. That that this has really gained a lot of momentum more much more recently. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know over the last couple of years, it seems to become more widely spoken about. And I like to think of it as really the explanation that unifies our biology, meaning. It unifies how our mind and body work in concert, one influencing the other, as we take in information from inside our bodies internally, as well as externally, which could be the environment. It could be between people, like between you and I, as we're having this conversation. And what Dr. Porges brilliantly studied and described is how, at the level of our nervous system, we're continuously scanning the environment, internal and external for what's going on for these cues. And then our nervous system shifts in response to how we interpret, how our nervous system interprets those cues. And that's a, the technical term for that is neuroception. And we can get into some of the details 
perhaps, or not. It, it depends <clears throat> what direction we want to take with the conversation. But I think <laughs> the important take home is that this is common across all humans. In fact, across all mammals. Mm-hmm. But we are all wired the same way. Our nervous systems all are all kind of functioning the same way. What may differ between people is the degree to which we are aware of how this works. And we've developed Mm -hmm. skills and strategies to kind of have some degree of influence or take some degree of control over all of this process. Deb Dana, who is kind of one of the pioneers of this as well, has this term of becoming an operator of your nervous system, which is kind of a cool Mm -hmm. way of thinking about it because we can't control our nervous system in in these processes. They, They occur subconsciously and instantaneously. But what we can learn to do is recognize what's happening and exert some degree of influence over it so that we can basically leverage our biology to work towards what matters most to us in any given Mm -hmm. circumstance as well as over the long term. And that's why I think it's such an important, essentially game-changing theory to understand and apply. Yeah. And I think from my understanding too of reading, being trained in it and reading about it, you know, both Darren and I have done similar but different trainings through the Polyvagal Institute. Mm -hmm. They have a website. I'll link that in the description that has these official trainings through this, this institute. Now, I think from my understanding too, is it's nothing, it's nothing new. I mean, it's not like that 1990s rolled around and that's when we just, we develop it. No, I think like Darren said, this is something that has wired into us. It's part of our, it's our nervous system essentially, right? That is across all mammals. And, and I totally agree that this is something that absolutely unifies all humans, yeah. no matter what culture, ethnicity, age, race, gender, that's, we all have this, this nerve, this polyvagal nerve that runs in us. And, and that, that is part of who we are and part of how we engage in the world. And so I think that's such a really, really kind of amazingly cool concept that, you know, to use, I guess, California language, amazingly cool concept (laughs) that, that we are at the core of who we are inside, that we really are more alike than we are different. Now, like Darren said, I think we'll, we'll talk a bit about maybe some of those things, barriers, environmental factors, or things that might cause influence on our awareness and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I think at the core, it really is truly, and I'm more and more studying this, the more I really believe how foundational this is to just understanding our experience and how it could really be a helpful lens as well as tool to be able to like you said, we can't necessarily can't control every aspect of our nervous system, but we've become to become aware of it. And therefore we can actually make changes. Yes. Absolutely. I think, and therefore we could we could shift things a bit. But before we go there, you mentioned a word that's I like. You know, I did this as a word of the day a while back. Yeah. But neuroception. Can we, can we can we speak a bit more about what is? Because I'm sure people are like as they're listening, you know, like neuroception. What the heck is that? So what what can we speak a little bit more about neuroception? Kind of break it down by its pieces a little bit more. Sure. So I mean, my understanding of neuroception is really the the process by which our autonomic nervous system is taking in that information, the internal and external information, and making a determination essentially about whether on balance there's cues of safety and connection or cues Mm -hmm. of uncertainty, risk, and threat. And that process, the kind of assigning, if you will, of the type of cue that it is in those terms is what neuroception is. And it's not Mm -hmm. something that we're aware of or that we can control, although we can indirectly influence the result of it which we can come back to in, in a moment. Perception is one of those key foundational principles of, of Dr. Portis's polyvagal theory. And the importance of those cues and whether they're safety and connection or uncertainty, risk and threat requires a little bit more discussion about our different physiological states is how mm-hmm. Dr. Porges calls them. I like to think of them as biological states. The reason being mm-hmm. when we say physiology, at least when I'm talking with healthcare people about physiology, they tend to think of that as being physical only and not psychological. However, it right. both. So each of yeah. these states, there are attributes of the states that, that are present or emerge from our minds, from our bodies, from our breathing, our heart rate, our gastrointestinal digestive system, mm-hmm. and even impacts on immune system, inflammation, and, and various other body systems. So maybe it would be a good thing, good time to talk about the, the three states that, that exist and how neuroception yeah. can kind of direct us off into one of those three states or perhaps a state yeah. with a combination of them. Yeah, and I think and I think that these, if you don't know already, if you haven't picked up what we're talking about, like polyvagal, that once I think Darren mentions these three states, we're 
I'd say 99% of us, 99% of us are like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what that is, right? Because mm -hmm. these are things that we've been learning about. We've all heard these terms. And so let's just jump right into those. Like, so what are those states that I think a lot of us are going to immediately be like, yep, I know exactly what yeah. we're talking about. So, so, so the states, states exist on like a hierarchy and, and at the top of the hierarchy, which would be like the most preferred state for connection, relating to other people, promoting our health and well-being through recovery and restoration is what's called the ventral vagal state. And that is governed by the ventral branch of the vagus nerve. Then the next rung down is the sympathetic state. And this people are usually pretty familiar with because it's that fight or flight type of state. Like you're revved up in response to some threat in the environment and you get into that fight or flight mode, your adrenaline gets pumping and, and that's the sympathetic state. And then below that is a dors what's called the dorsal vagal state. And that's mediated through the dorsal branch of the vagus nerve. So same nerve as the ventral state, but the other half of it, essentially, mm -hmm. maybe not technically like half, the but half. the back yeah. portion, the dorsal yeah, part of it. And that's yeah. what is essentially, if we would take the fight or flight terminology and carry it on, would be like freeze and submit would be in, mm -hmm. in that state. And that's where you, in, in essence, it's shut, it's a shutdown state. Yeah, and it's like an immobilized state. Immobilization, right? shutdown. And mm -hmm. what's really important to know is that each of these states are adaptive. None of them are mm -hmm. maladaptive in and of themselves. What is true, however, is that certain states are going to be better for accomplishing whatever is going on in a given situation. So it's not really the state per se that's adaptive or maladaptive. It's what state for what situation that becomes most important. So even though we say like we put the ventral vagal state at the top of the hierarchy and say, well, that's preferred. Well, if we're in a situation where, for example, there's a fire and we have to get out of a burning building, we don't want to be in a ventral vagal state. That's not going to be very adaptive in that situation to be all right. relaxed and, you know, you, you need some sympathetic mobilization there to, to get out of that burning building. And so it's right. just an example of how these states are all adaptive for particular mm. circumstances. Yeah. The key is really identifying the state that we're in and then determining whether it's the state that would be preferred for whatever it is is going on in, in the present moment. And I think it's a great way to put it is that these are these states are within our nervous system that they are adaptive, that they mm -hmm. they serve a purpose of survival, right? That yes. they serve a purpose of activating us, like if there is that fire to be mobilized into our kind of fight or flight response mm -hmm. to get us moving, right? We don't want to be in ventral right? Like just relaxing on the couch and, you know, the fire is burning and yeah. right, that, that, that would not be an adaptive response with our yeah. nervous system, nor would it be to be, to freeze and shut down. Although that does happen for some people, yes. right? That could put them yes. into a freeze or shut down state. And, you know, I think a lot of firefighters are coming in might be rescuing people who might be there, but they're not necessarily bad. They're not good or bad. Right. Like you said, but they're, they are adaptive. They serve a purpose. Now, again, we could maybe get triggered into a state that may not be so effective mm -hmm. uh, or we can get stuck in states for a long yes. period of time or, right. And those are things that does a little more nuance to it. But I think that these three core states is you're probably nodding along saying, yeah, I know exactly what that is. I know fight flight. I know shut yeah. down. I know freeze. And I think my understanding too, Stephen Porges, I was talking with Jan Winhall, who's a, one of the Polyvagal Institute trainers who I've been doing a lot of work through with treating trauma and addiction. I've been doing a lot of training with them on that. And she, I think she said that Stephen Porges apparently he, he's the one who discovered that, that, that the dorsal, like the, the shutdown fold dorsal branch. Cause I guess previously what we understood it was the fight, the fight, flight, freeze is how we pre pre nineties is what we understood it to be. But I guess through his research, he then discovered that kind of dorsal farther branch of yeah. that kind of immobilized shutdown collapse right. disassociative state, which is what he saw, I think when working with people in depression and things like that and trauma. Yeah. That he and, saw and originally I think neonates in the neonatal ICU and bradycardia yeah. meaning heart rate dangerously low. Right, which is a, that shutdown, yeah. mobilized state of the body the trying to survive. Yeah. yeah, which is interesting. So he kind of discovered this, that branch and kind of extended the, the, mm -hmm. the research. And so that's really cool how it's developed. And so, yeah, these are the main, the main states. And so I guess, can you give an example? You, you gave the fire one, but can you give, you know, maybe another example when someone might be, let's say, in, in a state that isn't so effective, but they might be stuck there? Like maybe can you give something you've seen in your profession even or? Well, sure. So, I, I mean, this this happens all the time. And, and I think as humans, especially in the present era, we spend a lot more time in a sympathetic state than we might recognize. And, and we see it all the time 
as do you, people getting stuck in sympathetic states with having paralyzing anxiety, for instance, would be stuck in a sympathetic state. Stuck in a dorsal vagal state would be somebody with very profound depression. And, you know, and in a lot of the work that, that I'm interested in with healthcare professionals, burnout is a huge issue. And really, you know, we talk about burnout, you know, we, the, the royal we, right? Talk about burnout as far as, you know, symptoms such as emotional exhaustion, dissociation or detachment from your professional role. If we're talking about occupational burnout, lack of fulfillment or enjoyment in performing that role. Well, really, if we put a polyvagal lens on burnout, it, what it really is, is a persistent or possibly even locked dorsal vagal state. Because if you go through those symptoms of burnout, they describe that shutdown state, that immobilized state to a T. And so this is where polyvagal theory becomes so helpful because if we think of things as an anxiety disorder, depression, or burnout, we can get stuck in the terminology and the labels. But if we think of it more biologically, as far as these states and neuroception and the things that we can do, and I'm sure we'll talk about this as, as we continue our conversation, to help our body shift states through using things like breathing patterns, muscle tone, our voice, our posture, our thoughts, all of these things, then we can do a lot of things to help ourselves in any given situation to help break out of being in a locked state, as we were talking about. And of course, there's many other interventions that are important as well. And, and you know, by no means is this a complete substitute for any of those, but it can be a very, very important adjunct. And another, I think, really important application of polyvagal theory within the healthcare realm is that in order for us to heal and recover and restore ourselves, we need to have ventral vagal tone or ventral vagal activation. That's what allows us to restore and maintain our homeostasis, our baseline state. Mm. Well, if we're off in sympathetic and dorsal states, we don't get to recover. We don't get to restore or go back to homeostasis. And that has profound impacts on our health, psychologically, mm. emotionally, physically, spiritually. And this is where the understanding of all of this can become so important just in day-to-day -day life if we're yeah. interested in pr promoting our own health and well-being. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you already began opening this up of the why, you know, why, why should we care about this? And you've already begun to, to go there. So let's look, let's go there a little bit more. Like at the essence, it's so important because why, like, why should anyone care really about this thing of pagal theory and knowing our nervous system and what state we're in? Like, why does it even matter? Like yeah. I'm playing it's dumb, but like, why does it, who cares? Like whatever, Darren, like, it's just another theory. Like, <laughs> like what, you know, why? Well, from my perspective, the reason why is that this is all happening whether we want it to or not, whether we choose to recognize it or not. And when I say this mm -hmm. is all happening, it's our nervous system is functioning in some of the ways we've mentioned. And there's, of course, more detail to it than we've gotten to to this point. But it is going on. These processes are occurring, whether or not we're aware of it, whether or not we want to try to have any influence over it. So the question really becomes, do we want to, as Deb Dana would say, be an operator of our nervous system? Or do we want to be a passive passenger and just go wherever the car takes us? And if we want to have some degree of autonomy over how we show up for ourselves and the people around us, if we want to have some degree of influence over how we function, the ability to pursue health and well-being, to accomplish whatever goals are important to us in any aspect of life, and we want to give ourselves the best chance of doing that, then this becomes really important. Because without having some influence over our nervous system, we cannot, con we have no, no control at all hmm. over what's hmm. going on. And, and there's already enough factors at play that we cannot control no matter what. Hmm. It would be important, I would think, for us to take some measure of control over that which we're able to. Yeah. And I, I, that's a beautiful picture I get when you say a you know, being the operator versus a passive passenger. I think it, I mean, it totally resonates with me. Not uh, entirely my original analogy. Yeah, I'm yeah. From, from Deb Dana with the operator, but, our, part, but adding the passive our, passenger part. Oh, I dig that. We're all borrowing from other people at the end of the day, yeah. right? I mean, I've, we're, all, we're all borrowing. So, but I love that. It sounds like something I say a lot with my clients and people I work with is, you know, who's in the driver's seat, right? Mm -hmm. Is it your emotions or, or, you know, and, and you're kind of watching, you know, frustration drive the car and you're just sitting there and to the will or, or are you in the driver's seat and you have emotions next to you? So who, who is it? So I, right. I totally resonate with that. It's a great image. It makes total sense. And I love the, 
passive passenger. It's yeah, it, I get that. And so we, we answered some of the why, kind of what it is. Here's the basic concept. Here's polyvagal, a little bit of quick history of what it is. Here's neuroception, why it might be important, because we want to be more of the, you know, the active operator in, you know, in the driver's seat. And so when you're first kind of working with individuals and working with whether it's a you know, fellow surgeon, you're trying to teach them about this, what's the first step that you would do with them to kind of maybe begin to bring awareness or understand it or begin to become aware of their own system? Like what are some things you teach to help them? Well, I mean, that's a great question and hard, hard to answer in general, because I think it's all individual specific. So for instance, you know, some people come with an understanding to some degree of this already. Some people want to have a deep understanding of how this works. Other people couldn't care less about the understanding, but want the application. And, and so I like to try to understand where somebody is coming from so that I can sort of meet them with what they want, what they're looking to get from it. Sure. Well, let's do a case example. Let's take, I don't know, Joe, the surgeon who let's, let's I'll, I'll build a quick case, you know, might as well make it fun and real for someone to get it. So I don't know, Joe, the surgeon maybe is married, has kids two kids married, let's just make it simple, works a lot of hours as a surgeon, comes home and has been noticing, comes to you saying, you know, Darren, I've been, you know, really just tired a lot. Maybe I'm drinking a bit more than normal, hard to focus, kind of feel like I'm on autopilot when I get home, kind of work a lot, don't sleep well, kind of, I'm feeling, you know, kind of tired out of it with my job and at home, just kind of, I just get easily frustrated a lot, maybe yell at my kids, maybe get in my fight with my wife a lot and then go to bed. So there's a quick little easy case, but I, I think it's something that we, I commonly deal with and probably mm -hmm. something that you might deal with. So, you know, let's say he's coming like, I don't know what's going on. Help me understand. Right. And obviously we'll do from polyvagal lens, you know, we'll, we won't deal with context right now of his life and things like that, but just to make it applicable to this, like where would you start with helping him see from that lens of polyvagal? What would you do? What would you start with? So I, I would start by finding out what, if anything, this person knows about polyvagal theory and any of its applications, because if they do have a, a baseline level of understanding about it, then maybe you can start a little bit further down the road. And if not, that's completely fine. I tend to start by just bringing up ex shared examples of experiences that illustrate how powerful polyvagal theory is that, that everybody can relate to. And so an example I frequently use is a surgery example. And that is that, you know, when we're going through training, we might do a very common procedure over and over and over again. And we do it with a, with a more senior surgeon and attending surgeon by our side. And we develop a competence at doing this. And the time comes where the attending surgeon says, okay, you're going to do this on your own now. And as soon as that moment happens and that surgeon leaves the room or goes to the other side of the room, but isn't standing beside you, all of a sudden this set of skills, physical skills that you're very competent at, that you're prepared to do, that you've done many times before, all of a sudden becomes this monumental task. Mm -hmm. And the simplest decisions become second guess. Confidence drops way off. And you're just not sure of even the most straightforward of the steps involved in doing this procedure. Well, why is that? That is, a, that is an experience, I think, shared by every surgeon, unless they're completely mm -hmm you know, out of touch with, with their <laughs> circumstances and even non-surgeons, you know, it could be making decisions about what medication to prescribe or, mm. you know, in a mental health setting, you know, making a diagnosis or what type of therapy to introduce or how to introduce it, any kind of decisions. Mm. Well, why does this happen? Because it happens consistently. Well, the reason it, or from a polyvagal perspective, the reason is, is that that attending surgeon, in, in the example I gave, is providing co-regulation. And we haven't talked about co-regulation to this point. But what co-regulation basically is, is that not only is that neuroception process going on continuously within us and our physiological states shifting, but when we're with someone else, their physiological state can impact our physiological state by virtue of the cues that they're sending us. So if this is a supportive person, we get cues of safety and connection. We will shift towards a more ventral vagal state and feel more calm, more grounded, have more curiosity, capacity to consider different options as examples. On the flip side, if that person is threatening, then we shift in the other direction into those sympathetic and dorsal states. In the example of the surgeon leaving the room, we lose that co-regulation and now are more flooded with these cues of uncertainty 
and risk and threat, which drive the physiology towards those sympathetic and dorsal states. And so I like to bring up this example because every healthcare professional can relate to it. In fact, I think most humans can relate to it the first time they're left with a responsibility, like driving a car, for instance, the first time on your own when you're a kid. By going through that example and by being able to explain it in the way we just did, I think helps people to see that there is an explanation for what's going on, that Mm -hmm. in addition to it, that the explanation is not their fault. It's not that they've done something wrong or that they should have done something differently. It's that this is their biology. Mm-hmm. And there's things we can do to work with it to prevent those situations from getting too far down the tracks. Yeah. And so that that's a, a good starting point, I think, just to open the, the door, basically, to somebody yeah. being interested in, in contemplating, considering not just the theory, but more importantly, how to apply the principles. Hmm. I've had that experience, too. You know, I remember when sitting with my first few clients, you kind of yeah. all the stuff you study about kind of you feel frozen. I remember feeling a little frozen. Mm-hmm. Like, what do I say? And yeah. everything kind of just, it's blank, right? It's just kind of disassociated yeah. frozen state. Of, right. Despite the fact that you know exactly what you're doing. Totally. Yeah. And, 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 but then you, and then it comes to you and you kind of navigate it and even if it's shaky, but you get through it. Yeah. But it's something that I think it, it resonates so well, that example of, you know, that, that happens to, I would say most, if not all people are like, even mm-hmm. probably taking a test, you study for a test yeah. or an exam and you sit down and it's like frozen, everything stops functioning. Right. right? Or the anxiety, right? I want to leave. I don't want to be here. Exactly. And cause that's our nervous system always activated. And so when we have this awareness of kind of that, we all can resonate and, and, and relate to a similar experience or experiences, or maybe even something slightly different. So, you know, this guy coming to see you, Joe, the surgeon says, oh, I get that makes sense. Okay, that happened to me. And so now the next step would be, okay, I have this awareness of that it's doing something and that we've all had this experience. So now what? Like, what do I then do to become more aware of and Mm -hmm. become in tune with my nervous system state? So how do I how do I build awareness of those states? Like, what do I need to do? Because a common example, you know, professionally, is some people that it's like sometimes the awareness is at first is difficult to see. You know, where am I? Mm-hmm. Um, they don't always necessarily know how the language to describe. So what are some things that you might help someone begin to build to develop this language piece or understanding, especially when they get stuck in these states? Yeah. Well, I think like you're saying, the first step is really the awareness piece. And, and there's a couple of parts to that. One is while there's certain characteristics of each of these states, there is individual different differences, right? How we might experience them or think about them. And so I think it's important that we each kind of figure out for ourselves, what, what does it feel like in our body? What does it feel like in our mind with our thoughts, our feelings when we're in each of those three states? Because if we mm-hmm. can't describe those for ourselves, how can we possibly identify them? We would just right. be guessing. So it starts with, yeah. with that, like figuring out those different attributes of the states and at the same time, starting to develop really good awareness skills and Mm -hmm. you know in a different realm you might call that mindfulness for me with healthcare professionals i try to avoid terms like meditation and mindfulness because it tends to not be met with an open mind (laughs) but it's really just attention training or awareness training and that can be done through for instance a formal mindfulness practice and it can also be done informally just being aware of everything as you walk through your day if you go for a walk outside in the park taking in Mm. all the various sensations that you're exposed to. And that's developing that ability to become aware. And I think that's really the starting point because without being able to identify our state, which requires awareness, we can't use any skills or strategies to shift our state because we don't know where we're starting and we don't know where to go and we don't know when we've got there. Yeah. And so if I'm Joe, the surgeon and let's use this home example, I get home and man, I just feel like I'm, I'm short tempered. I lose my patience easily and I'm often like yelling and angry, mm-hmm. you know? So what, Darren, what would that be? What, what state do you think I'm in? I'm just like on edge and, you know, super easily annoyed. Yes. So, I mean, in, in an actual encounter with somebody, I, I would kind of more want them to answer these for themselves, but that's a very typical description of a sympathetic state, right? It's mm. much yeah. more into that aggressive fight-like state than the mm-hmm. flight state, which is still part of sympathetic, but in a different part of the, continuum, I guess you might say, but if it's more aggressive, fighting, loud voice, that kind of thing, then, then that's a sympathetic state. And yeah. it would be important for this individual to start to be able to recognize when they're yeah. into that state, ideally as soon as possible. So before the yelling or screaming starts, for instance, 
right. to start to feel so, the sensations in their, in their body, yeah. perhaps their heart rate going up or their breathing pattern changing, recognizing the thoughts in their mind that start to signal that, hey, we're off into a sympathetic state. Because the mm-hmm. sooner we recognize it, once we develop some skills to work with that, then we can implement those skills sooner before we do anything that we you know, might later prefer we had not done. So if we're in that state, and let's say Joe gets this understanding, he's like, "Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I can see why it's the fight or flight." You know, because Joe's a surgeon, so he has got he's got some you know he's got some knowledge about these things. Mm-hmm. So he's like, "Oh, that makes sense, Darren. Okay, yeah, I, I could see that. I'm definitely in this kind of fight fight state, and kind of which is really you know fights fueled by aggression, resentment, uh, uh, regression, annoyance, frustration, things like that. Where flights more fear based, right, yeah. and worry. And so yeah, I could see that. You know, easily annoyed and short with people, and 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 so Darren, what do I do now? So I'm in the state. How do I? How do I begin to kind of get out of this state? What, what are some things when someone's stuck in that kind of activated, mobilized state? What are some things to help them? Well, so there's different perspectives here. And, and I think the, the most important take-home message is to create a very large, what I like to think of as a robust toolbox with lots of different tools in it of different types of skills and strategies that can be used. Mm. Not every skill is going to work in every situation. So the more tools we have at our disposal, the better off we are. In general, from a sympathetic state, if we're wanting to shift to have more ventral vagal activation present, some very effective things to do include changing our breathing pattern. We can come back to that in a moment. That's probably the most effective way of shifting states is through our breathing. Other things include uh, relaxing the muscle tone, particularly in our jaw, in our neck, in our shoulders, because usually when we're in that mode, the jaw is clenched. You know, the shoulders are upright, you know, the facial grimaces. Yeah, all of that. So relaxing those muscles can be helpful. Even using our voice. So singing, humming, things like this can be very, very effective in shifting towards ventral vagal states because another factor with polyvagal theory that we haven't talked about is what's called the social engagement system. And this is basically the connection between the vagus nerve and essentially everything in our face. So the muscles, the inner ear for hearing, the tone of our voice, the degree of relaxation of our jaw, and then, of course, into heart rate and breathing. So having a whole bunch of skills like that, I think, is really important. And so too are mind-based skills. So that ability to dispute the story in your mind that's leading to you Mm. going into that sympathetic state. The problem with some of the mind-based skills is while they're very effective, they require intentional cognitive function. And as soon as we shift into those sympathetic and dorsal states, the degree, and I'd love your take on this, Travis, but from my understanding, both in theory, as well as in lived reality, the degree of cognitive control we have when we're truly in a sympathetic or dorsal state is pretty reduced, if not absent. And so it's very hard if we're in a full sympathetic state to think our way out of it. Mm-hmm. Rather, what we need to do is use these body-based skills to start to shift more ventral energy in there, ventral vagal tone in there. And then once we do that, our cognitive skills come back online in a sense, become more effective is probably a better way of saying it. And then they can you know, be layered on top of the breathing, of the changes in muscle tone, of using our voice and other skills. I, I 100% agree. Anecdotal evidence. Pretty much every time I deal with someone in an activated fight flight response, even myself, is you're not going to be able to think clearly because mm-hmm. your survival brain's on. So yeah. it's going to be right. It it might be skewed. It might be inaccurate. It might be all over the place. It you know, there's so many things that can influence how we think and how we operate when when in when we're in the states. You know, people that I work with. You know, whether we you know what's their trauma history, what, mm-hmm. you know, what there's so many, you know, what was their life like in home and how they were raised and, you know, what kind of emotion, emotional intelligence do they have? Like there's all these little factors that play in. And so I think when we're in these states, those things come flooding in and our survival brain kicks in and yeah. we do it. And we do what we do, what we know how to do to survive. And that kind of automatic pilot, that yeah. kind of passive passenger kicks in to keep us moving. And again, it's going to be adaptive in that, in that sense, but it might be an effective in reality, if, for example, you know, let's say use Joe, if he's, let's say he's, you know, his kids are getting him annoyed and now he's, you know, he's already frustrated. So he yells. So while that might be adaptive for his nervous system and the fact that I'm like doing this, it's not effective for the relationship with his kids because right. now he's yelling at his kids. But if he doesn't have a model for anything other than that, like let's say his dad yelled at him or parents yelled at him, if that's his model, that becomes this kind of natural state and he can go into this kind of similar state that he was as a child. Yeah. And so he's just going to do these things until he calms down. He won't, 
because usually in that situation, I've worked with men like this and women, is after they calm down later, you know, maybe half hour later or hour later, that's when the guilt comes in because then they're thinking, oh, why did I do that? Because yeah. then the guilt and shame. And then it's like, oh, that was, I know that wasn't helpful because that part of the brain then becomes activated to actually process <laughs> and think through, like, was it actually effective? And most people would probably say, yeah, it really wasn't. Yeah. Even though I did it, I know it. there's something about it that doesn't feel quite right. And I, I know this in my head because my dad used to do it. Why did I do what my dad did to me? Like, I never thought I would do that, right? Yeah. And then we could beat ourselves up. Oh, exactly. And, and this is where this understanding of how our nervous system works becomes so important. Because if we have, like ourselves, have acted in that way, we can now acknowledge that, but do so without judgment and say, it's not because I'm bad or I'm wrong or whatever. It's like, this is what was going on. This is how my nervous system reacted. It's not what I wanted. And you can do things to make that better. So we can have more self-compassion by understanding mm -hmm. these processes. Also, we can have more compassion for those around us when we can understand that another person's behavior, just as it is for us, our behavior is a reflection of our biological or physiological state, whatever terminology we use. It's not like a fixed trait of that person. Mm -hmm. And so that allows us to have more space and more compassion for ourselves and for other people, right? Yeah. Like that's just huge. It doesn't matter what area of life you're talking about. Like that's the starting point for a whole lot of really important things. And, and, and let's say Joe now flip, let's say he goes to this state of, you know, when I get home, I'm so done. I check out and mm -hmm. I turn on Netflix for three hours and I'm just zoning out. Yeah. What would that state be typically? So, so this is a great point that I've had discussions with people about, about this idea when you're, you've completed a really, could be physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually demanding activity, and you're just spent and you need to recover. So much of the time we just go and we just sort of collapse, like with what mm -hmm. you described. Well, that's mm -hmm. really a dorsal state. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of similarities though, to the ventral state that would be better for recovery and restoration following a high demand activity, right? Because in the, you know, if we got into a true ventral state, you might just sit down and relax, but you'd be more engaged, more connected connection. Mm -hmm. That's really the big differentiating attribute between dorsal and ventral, at least in this situation is the degree of connection. So when we come home and sit down on the couch and just turn on Netflix, are we there and connected to our body and perhaps the people around us to what we're watching? If so, maybe you're in a ventral state, which would be great for the recovery mm -hmm. restoration process. If, however, you sit down and you're watching the same thing on Netflix on the same couch, but you're disconnected from yourself, you're spaced out, basically, you're not even really yeah. paying attention to what the show is. And if there's other people with you, you're completely disconnected from them as well. Well, that's a dorsal state. And why yeah. that distinction is important is that if what our body needs, what our biology needs is recovery, restoration, and homeostasis, we will not get that from the dorsal state. We mm -hmm. need to get into a ventral state, which requires a different process than the dorsal state. Hmm. So well said. I love the, that you differentiate between the two because I think we could, I think it's helpful to re, to differentiate because you're right. They, there's similarities between both mm -hmm. the dorsal and ventral state. Yeah. And I think I like how you put the connection is so key that we're actually connected to our body. We're, we're not disassociated from, we're right. not numbing from, we're not, you know, cause in a ventral state, we're not actually numb. We could feel calm and relaxed. Mm -hmm. Right. But we're not numb, numbing, yeah. disassociation, immobilization, because actually there is a state that Jan Winhall came up with the six F's, these in-between states, which mm -hmm. is, you know, this other thing. And she called this in-between state between dorsal vagal and ventral vagal, she called it the flow state. So it's, it's, which I think is where you probably do really deep recovery. And she called it because it, it's, it's a little bit of dorsal but in grounded safety, mm -hmm. yes. in grounded connection. So you're pulling that kind of, it's like when we get in a really deeply meditative state or maybe mm -hmm. a really deeply spiritual state or maybe a something where we're really relaxed and we're kind of recovering. And you might have experienced that maybe if you're taking like a, a warm bath or, you know, something to that effect where it's it's dorsal energy, but grounded safety. Yeah. You know, so I, I like that, that she, you know, she did in between states, which makes so much sense when you when you think about it that way, because it's pulling it, but it's not disassociating. And I think that's so key because you're right. We could do the same thing on the same couch, but fully be connected and integrated mm -hmm. and recovering exactly. um, versus I'm numbing out and I'm just, I'm disconnecting. And so let's say we're disconnecting. Let's just say we're numbing for a second. Mm -hmm. You know, someone, you know, what are a couple things 
one, two, three things that someone who's maybe immobilized, disassociated, disconnected, how can they move out of an immobilized state? Maybe dorsal branch. Yeah. What, what can they do to kind of take some steps, so to speak, up the ladder? Right. So the, the kind of traditional, I guess you'd say, teaching of it all is that you can't really jump states. So you can't go directly from dorsal to ventral. That's not a possibility. You've got to go through sympathetic. Now, you don't have to stay in sympathetic long, but you do have to touch into it a little bit. And so I think the, the best strategies when we recognize that we're in a dorsal state is to introduce some degree of energy into our system. And that could be in the form of a little bit of very gentle physical activity. I'm not talking about a strenuous workout. I'm talking about maybe getting up and going for a light walk or just moving around a little bit. Again, different breathing patterns can be effective. And it would probably be a good idea for us to come back to that in a moment about what, what sure. breathing patterns for what situations, because there's a lot of, mm -hmm. there's a lot of misconceptions out there about, about what breathing patterns and, you know, a lot of hacks out there about what breathing patterns to use and they don't apply in all situations, but there's certain breathing patterns that can help introduce more energy into the system so that you get into a bit of sympathetic energy, and then you can shift into a more ventral stabilized state. Mm -hmm. So from that dorsal state, that would be the. The big key, I think, is a little bit of, of mobilization and then mm -hmm. shifting towards ventral. Yeah, it, I think it's so key. We can't skip states. We have to. We need that energy to move us back. It's like it's like a boom. It's almost like a, a slingshot, so to speak. Like I think of like mm -hmm. slingshotting around the moon. Like we need that pull to then whip us around, right? That yeah. we need that kind of that energy. What are you know? What are a couple, maybe what's a breathing state for maybe a dorsal immobilized state versus a breathing pattern that might be useful for yeah. an activated sympathetic state? So. When you really get into breathing patterns, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. But to keep it simple, I like to talk with people about three different breath patterns. One to increase ventral energy, ventral uh, vagal tone. One to kind of stay where you're at. And one to ramp you up a little bit. And mm -hmm. so if we're looking to introduce more ventral vagal energy, like decrease you know, the energy level from a sympathetic state, a relatively prolonged exhalation relative to the inhalation with a mechanic through the nose and using the belly or the diaphragm to breathe is the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. And there's ways you can figure out the exact ratio that works for a given person between inhalation and exhalation, but typically it's like four to five or six. So like four mm -hmm. second inhalation, five or six second exhalation with no breath holds in between. And that will tend to increase ventral vagal activation for people that have wearable tech, they can see that their HRV should go up, their heart rate variability should go up when they use that breathing pattern. The one to kind of stay where you're at is that box breathing. So it's very symmetric like a box. So inhalation, say for four seconds, hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four. And when that inhalation and exhalation becomes symmetric, that tends to kind of keep you where you are physiologically. And then to increase energy would be a longer inhalation than exhalation. And so by keeping it simple with just three breath breathing patterns, there's one for any scenario in there. Mm -hmm. I think it makes it more feasible. It doesn't seem quite as overwhelming that you got to have all these different patterns because the other yeah. thing too, is we have to practice these in order right. for it to be effective when we most need it. It's not well, enough no, to just question. say, I know which breath pattern to use. I got to practice it. Otherwise it's not going to be there. Right. It's like any skill. If you don't practice right. it, it's not going to, you're not going to be proficient with it. Right. And let's just talk about that for a second. And and I love that. Yeah. I love the, 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 the three types of breathing. I think it's so important to know because you're right. You want to know the right tool, mm -hmm. going back to the tool belt, the right tool for the right job, yep. so to speak. I like the four, six, eight breathing or pranayama breathing, right? It's helpful to reduce stress that ex longer exhale. Yep. There's another short ramp up breath I've, I've learned through this app called, you know, mental. It's a mental health app for men. It's pretty cool. And they do this thing where it's a a quick two second inhale inhalation mm -hmm. with a one second kind of grunting exhalation, mm -hmm. which is good for like getting your body yeah. activated. Yeah, another longer That's inhalation than exhalation. Yeah. Uh, there's long, many variations inhalation. on yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so and it's so cool because these things you do feel it. You know, and, and I think the important thing you just hit on, we'll kind of start to wrap up with this is the practice. Yeah. And I don't know what your experience and my experience as a therapist, I'll, I'll I will get cl certain clients to come in and say, you know, you know, Travis, it, it didn't work for me. I'm like, okay, well, well, tell me what didn't work. And I'm obviously generalizing here. I, I do get very nuanced and specific with, with clients and kind of tailor it. But a, a common theme I'll hear is that, you know, that doesn't work for me. I'm like, well, how, 
you know, tell me about it. What happened? Kind of, I get it. I, I want to get an understanding mm-hmm. of the context and what's going on. And a common theme I hear is that I think practice <laughs> just isn't really done enough. Yep. It's maybe they might have practiced it once or twice. And then when they didn't, when they needed it, either they forgot or, you know, they, it didn't really work for them <laughs> or something. And so, so in this circumstance, why is practice so important when it comes to doing these breathing patterns? Like, like, why do we need to do that? Like, wh- why, why only one or two times? Why is that not enough? Well, I mean, again, it, it's like any physical skill. I mean, if we want to be able to shoot a basketball, ride a bike, um, you name it, we have to practice it. Play an instrument, we have mm-hmm. to practice it. It's while, while breathing is something we do all the time and we do it most of the time unconsciously, it just happens. In order to do it in this deliberate way to bring about a certain effect, we have to practice doing it because... If we don't, we're not going to be able to, in a sense, go and automatically start to engage the right breathing patterns. In addition, when we practice these, this is what, from a polyvagal perspective, the terminology would be neural exercises, which is training our nervous system. And this is another really important part to it all, is that when we train, for instance, by doing breathing practices, not only are we developing proficiency with that skill, but we're also training our nervous system such that it can become either, you know, the terminology is either resilient or flexible. I mean, kind of the same thing in this context, meaning we can develop more robustness in our nervous system such that we don't shift off into sympathetic and dorsal states quite as easily because we have greater resting ventral vagal tone, which brings in another principle we didn't talk about, which is the Inter- the principle of physiological state is an intervening variable, meaning if we're in a ventral state and we're presented with kind of an on the fence kind of stimulus, we're more likely to interpret that as a cue of safety and connection. Whereas if we're sympathetic and we all have this experience, we're ramped up already, a very trivial cue might make us more ramped up. But if we're more relaxed, when we get that same cue, it doesn't do anything. And that's because of the intervening mm-hmm variable. And so by training, by doing neural exercises, we're in essence increasing our ventral, our resting ventral vagal tone, which is keeping us more in that ventral stabilized state so that we have more, more room before we reach that breaking point, if you will, Mm. and shifting off into sympathetic states. So, so the practices are there to, for a few things. One is to develop proficiency at the skill. And then the other is this whole concept of actually training our nervous system. Yeah. And I, what comes to mind is in the trauma world, this, this concept that Dan Siegel coined, that our window of tolerance. Mm-hmm, exactly. What we're able to tolerate. And so this, these neural exercises can expand yeah. our capacity. And, and, and of course, our capacity could change depending on our day too, right? right? We might have had a really long day, really rough day. We may not have eaten a lot of food or had enough water. So our capacity could start to shrink. And so I, I think it's, I'm so glad that you included that these intervening states and how these things could shift depending on what state we're already, we, we are already in and how we can kind right. of tip over to the state just because of where we are in the day. Yep. And then we have our window of tolerance in general. And then I'm also thinking of people that have experienced quite a bit of trauma in their life that also can, you know, another thing I've used with people that have had a lot of trauma is I think sometimes their their nervous system needs to be, I, I use the term needs to be recalibrated because mm-hmm. maybe they're hyper tuned or yeah. hypo tuned, like they're picking up threat when there really isn't threat. Yeah. So the nervous system is hyper vigilant. They're hyper aware, hyper aroused, and so they're picking up things when maybe there isn't a threat or hypo, sure. you know, hypo. They're numbing when maybe there's a threat and they need to pick up threat, but they're not picking up threat. So all these things, because our nervous system adjusts and kind of calibrates to life experiences, mm-hmm. whether it's societal, cultural, things like that. And then as we get older, we have to. And I think that's a piece too, as we're working with clients and even probably with surgeons that you're working with, is we got to understand someone's entire context, right? Yes. Because all these things matter as we get to understand what are they doing. And so then we, but these neural exercises, regardless of where you are, begin to do, I think they do begin to increase our window of tolerance. They begin to become more aware of our nervous system. We feel more skillful. And when we do practice, one final question with that, do you think there's a helpful use in purposely, let's say you're in a ventral state. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a use in that state to practice ramping our nervous system up and then bringing it back down? Absolutely. And, And then, and then why? Why would that absolutely. be helpful for us to do that? So the and so absolutely great, great point, really important, and I totally agree that that is useful. And and the best analogy I have is that if we are trying to improve our physical fitness, be it stamina or strength, we have to push our tolerance. 
in order to gain more ability to lift a larger weight or to run a further distance, whatever it may be. And the same is true for our nervous system. So we have to be careful when we train in that way to push our limits because we want to do that starting from a ventral place. Otherwise, we can get ourselves very deep and locked into states we don't want to be. But if we're to really develop the ability, and, and this is responding to life, right, to manage the cues that come up as well as possible, then training that ability by intentionally challenging our nervous system from a safe place, a connected place, and then recovering right back to safety and connection is exactly the way to do that. Yeah, I like that. I think that's that's very important. And, and I think it's important to know where we are. And I think it goes back to our awareness of what state we're in. What's our neuroception? You know, do I feel yep. more safety, cues of safety in my ventral? Or am I activated, right, in a, in a sympathetic state? Am I feeling numb and disassociated? Because I think, and I know, not only think, but know from experience professionally and as well as personally, that that awareness as we come back to this whole topic is the, I, and there's so many topics we haven't discussed tonight, by the way. I, I think this oh, applies sure. to us as, as, as dads working with our children. I mean, that's a whole thing we probably talk about on, you know, why it's important as parents and dads to know our nervous system state, especially when we're parenting our kiddos and our ki kids are dysregulated and co-regulation. I mean, that's a, well, I'll, I'll have, let's, let's, let's set up a teaser for, for the next part where we talk about this specifically when we're working with our kids, okay. because this is like, let's do that from a political perspective is a whole, whole other topic of yeah. conversation. That's super important and yeah. makes a world of difference. So let's do that. So this is a teaser, everyone listening. We are going to have a conversation around parenting from, with a, from a polyvagal lens because I really firmly believe how important that is. And it's really cool when you understand that and how yeah. actually is a little, not spoiler, but I think how life-giving it could be mm -hmm. yeah. when you know this, yeah. especially with your kids and with yourself and with your partner, yeah. like how really how amazing it could be. So a little teaser, we're going to do that. But Darren, man, there's so much stuff I want to keep geeking out, but I'm conscious of the time and it's an hour and people are probably like, okay, I'm ready to be done. Yeah. But this was such a good conversation. Yeah, I think, for sure. you know, I think we, I think we would help out Joe, the surgeon really well with giving him some understanding and some experience and awareness as well as some breathing techniques to help him at least to begin to get started. Yeah. I know that that'd be the beginning process to help Joe, the surgeon to, to work through some, some healing and, and health, but thank you for being on. And where can we find you? If anyone wants to work with you listening, like, Oh, I like how Darren, sounds and I want to work with him and it sounds cool. Like he works with surgeons. Maybe I'm a surgeon and I would like to get help, but where can we find sure, you? Sure. Re really the best place is my website, which is just my name, darrendavidson.com. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn under the same name. And then I have a weekly blog and it's also published on Substack and on Substack it's under the health, the healthcare athlete. Uh, so those are really the best ways to find me. There's contact forms on the website. So if people want to get in touch, that's a great way to do it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Darren, again. Have an excellent night, and I can't wait for our part two for this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Travis. It's been a great conversation, and yeah, I absolutely look forward to the next part.